lip the surly bonds of earth and dance the skies on laughter's silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept height with easy grace. Where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silence, lifting mind, I prod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touch the face of God. Hi, and welcome to the sixth installment of The Dad Project. Glad to have you back, and tonight we will remain at the Naval Air Test Center in Patuxent River, Maryland. As a recent graduate of the test pilot school, my dad would then walk across the street, so to speak, to take on his first assignment as an engineering test pilot at the Naval Air Test Center. But first, graduation. When I graduated from Thousand Oaks High School in Thousand Oaks, California in 1976, my graduating class took the required trip to Disneyland for grad night. When the 32nd class of the U.S. Navy Test Pilot School graduated, their class was loaded onto a C-54 transport and flown first to the LTV Aerospace Corporation plant in Dallas, Texas to take a closer look at the F-8 Crusader as it worked its way through the assembly line and finally to the flight line. As they filed off the bus, they were handed Stetsons to commemorate their visit. In one of those odd deathbed moments, my dad wondered what he did with that hat and where it might be. Their second destination would be the Lockheed plant in Burbank, where the group would be introduced to various Lockheed aircraft and projects. The touch a truck event there was the U-2 with a flight demonstration where my dad said it climbed like an angel. And next to Cincinnati, Ohio, and the General Electric Aviation plant to have a closer look at the finer points of the manufacture and testing of jet engines that many of the group would rely on in the various airframes they would fly using GE jet engines. And finally, back to Pax River, where my dad had hoped he would be given a cutting edge outer envelope jet to fly for his first assignment. As he said in an article he wrote for Flight Journal in October of 2004, for one, he couldn't believe he was there, and that he'd soon be flying Navy's newest aircraft and performing amazing aerial feats, and that he'd be pushing the envelope in the true right stuff tradition of those before him. Clark Gable, Errol Flynn, and the real ones such as Scott Crossfield and Chuck Yeager. When he was there, the center had three test divisions. Flight tests that practiced the intricacies of flying qualities and performance testing, the division everybody wanted, weapon systems tests that tested new radars, avionics, and drop bombs, and finally, service tests that did, as he said, cats and dogs work, aeromedical equipment, cockpit design, and engine performance. My dad ended up in service test, and that was not where he wanted to be, but the needs of the Navy and his previous flying experience had him preordained for once again flying the S2F. Repeat after me, the Stoof. The good news was despite being just out of the test pilot nest, he was given his own project, which was a rare occurrence. He would be flying a Stoof that had been configured to test the Fulton Aero Retriever System, better known as Skyhook for carrier-based covert and pilot rescue at sea. The branches that make up our military tree are very capable warfighting machines that have seen glory on many battlefronts, but unbeknownst to the general public is that some of their greatest victories have been in the halls of the Pentagon, as each branch maneuvers for funding for their pet projects at the literal expense of someone else's pet project. Then there are projects like Skyhook that appeal to the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, and the CIA, and instead of pooling resources to optimize the testing process, each branch tested the program in their own way. 
While the Navy Skyhook pro program had been in development since 1950, the CIA had been testing in parallel their own system, and the Air Force, although coming late to the game in testing their own system, would go on to have the only operational squadron that consistently used the system. The Fulton recovery system had been invented by Robert Edison Fulton Jr., and he would later dub it Skyhook. My dad said that Fulton was one of the most fascinating men he ever met, a direct descendant of Robert Fulton, who invented the steamship, and perhaps to Thomas Edison, thus the middle name, and a true Renaissance man, inventor, poet, artist, photographer, engineer, and adventurer. My dad first met Bob at Pax River in 1963, when he hopped off the wing of his personal red P-51 Mustang in a medium gray custom tailored suit draped over a blue Oxford shirt, wool chalice tie, and a fedora on his head. My dad said he was a uni unique mix of class, intelligence, culture, and fighter pilot spirit. The Skyhook system was the outgrowth of Fulton's All-American Aviation Rescue System that was used in World War II to pick up items and people in remote areas without airstrips. It was very similar to the method used by small planes to pick up sky banners. The disadvantage of the system for larger aircraft is that the aim point is behind and below the pilot, making pickup difficult. Skyhook put the aim point on the nose of the aircraft. From its inception, Skyhook was intended for use with clandestine services, yet only one clandestine operation has ever been made public. That would be Operation Cold Feet, an operation that seems like something out of Alistair McLean's Ice Station Zebra. The Soviet Union had established a number of manned drift stations on the Arctic ice beginning in 1937 and finally ending in 1991. Because of the volatility of the ice, their existence was tenuous and could last for years or weeks. They were used for scientific study and espionage. In May of 1961, a Navy patrol plane reported that Soviet drift station NP-9, NP for North Pole, had been abandoned. The Office of Naval Research, ONR, had its own drift stations and had been testing acoustical equipment for the detection of submarines beneath the ice, and assumed the Soviets were doing the same. The abandoned NP-9 seemed an opportunity to find out what the Soviets were doing. But how to get there and return with any booty was a more pressing problem. As mentioned earlier, the ONR had been developing and testing the Skyhook system since 1950, and in 1958 had successfully picked up Staff Sergeant Levi Woods into the belly of a Lockheed P-2V patrol bomber. So the Skyhook system would allow one or two paratroopers to be dropped on the ice floe and then picked up with any equipment and records the Soviets had left behind. By the time the operation was ready to launch, various organizational delays had allowed NP-9 to drift beyond the range capabilities of the P-2V, but just as it seemed all was lost, news came that NP-8, another drift station, had been quickly abandoned by the Soviets after a pressure ridge had destroyed their ice runway. By this time, a CIA B-17 had been converted and outfitted with the Skyhook system. The Intermountain B-17 was the last of a fleet of CIA B-17s that had been used for overflights of the Chinese mainland, the rest of the fleet having been shot down by the Chinese. Fortunately, the original jumpers from the aborted flight to NP-9, Major James Smith of U.S. Air Force, a Russian linguist who had served on American drift stations, and a former Antarctic geophysicist, Lieutenant Leonard Leshack, were still available. So, on May 28, 1962, they parachuted onto NP-8, where they remained for six days before the B-17 returned. In three pickups, they were able to retrieve the Soviet equipment and records first, and then the men. Operation Cold Feet, by clandestine standards, was very successful. The number of different operators involved in the operation blurred as many lines as possible, from the aircraft being part of a young but soon to be expanded CIA Air Force, a Pan Am Airways navigator experienced in polar navigation, Air Force and Navy personnel, and Robert Fulton himself on board. For the Air Force's part, they had been sniffing around the edges of the program since its inception, and in early 1960, the Lockheed Aircraft Division out of Georgia, the home of their C-130 protection line, presented an unsolicited preliminary study of the installation of the Fulton Skyhook Aerial Recovery System on the C-130. 
From there, the Air Force interest began in earnest, and in 1965, spe Special Operations Squadrons were operating with 75 C-130s modified with the Fulton system. In 1963, the Army solicited a proposal to outfit the Skyhook system on the C-7 Caribou for its own extraction system for the recovery of their special operators, notably Green Berets. In fact, the testing of the system was reported in a local newspaper and quoted as Sergeant Raven Norton Jr. saying, We think of it as parachuting in reverse. We had plenty of ways to get them in, but we needed a way to get them out if they couldn't walk or ride out. Between the various services, numerous live pickups were successfully made. Sadly, one of the failures happened while my father was test flying the system. When the sailor who had volunteered for the test flight had been reeled in on the rescue line, he had been spinning on that line for five to ten minutes before being hauled in. The crew failed to attach the safety line to him before they removed the rescue line, and being very dizzy, he stepped back out of the access hatch to his death. My dad had told me that story years before with difficulty. In any case, there had been considerable consternation with how to proceed with training on the system, live pickups or dummy pickups. Eventually, the dummy pickup camp held sway and the last live pickup was in 1982, and the Skyhook system was finally removed from all aircraft in 1998. As noted earlier, the ONR had been testing the Skyhook system on a P-2V and had successfully made the first live pickup in 1958 with that aircraft. But like other programs the Navy was looking into, the ability to do it with a carrier-borne aircraft became paramount. The natural airframe at the time was the S-2F. So in preparation for the testing program, the Naval Air Rework Facility at Pensacola attached the Skyhook boom to the Stoof's nose, removed all the ASW equipment, reconfigured the engine nacelles, and installed a winch near the hole created when the radar antenna was removed. From there, my dad and his program partner, Lieutenant Fred Horner, made 24 dummy pickups before my dad made the S-2's first live pickup of Marine Master Sergeant Paul Mayer at Pax River on April 4th. 1963. Horner followed by making the first night pickup in the S-2. Part of the testing arc required the pickup of one person from a life raft, and it was determined that person should be a Navy SEAL. My dad wrote that he looked like a SEAL recruiting poster, matinee idle looks, and stiffly starched greens tucked into glistening jump boots. As it turned out, he was just that. Radio man, second class, Dick Marshenko, who would go on to lead the first SEAL Team 6 unit, seal legend and then went on to write the rogue warrior combat and spook genre books the pickup was made at the navy's mine warfare center in panama city florida on january 21st 1964. the testing cycle then proceeded to two-person pickups and after a workup of 22 dummy pickups a successful live two-person pickup was made on march 24th 1964. The three-person pickup proceeded naturally from there, and after ten dummy pickups, it was determined that the S-2's winch was too small for the weight. By then, the Navy's testing program was winding down, and the results passed on to the Air Force. From 1965 on, the Air Force would be the only service to operationally use Skyhook. The Air Force went ahead with testing their C-130 base system to extract six operators at once, a special, team op a special operations team. But when the cable broke on the 53rd dummy pickup of a planned 56 pickup cycle, testing was halted. And as mentioned earlier, the Air Force removed all Fulton Skyhook systems by 1998 from their C-130s, as by that time, long-range helicopters with refueling capability had the range to do what the Skyhook system had been doing for 30-odd years. In any case, my dad's last flight on the Skyhook program would be on October 8, 1964. He would remain at service test until the end of January 1965 when we and he would move to Virginia Beach, Virginia, where he would be attached to the USS Randolph CBS-15 as the assistant navigator. From here, the whole family, sans my sister, would take a cruise to the Med. So, until next time, thanks for joining me for the sixth installment of The Dad Project. I continue to tell the stories I had hoped my father would tell me, so please subscribe if you'd like to hear more, and until next time, Thanks for watching and enjoy what life has given you. Ciao.